Now, from News Channel 9, a special presentation. I'm Jennifer Sanders. Thank you so much for joining me for this special edition of Hidden History. Imagine living in a close-knit neighborhood, reflective of your culture and your values, and then governmental decisions lead to the decimation of your entire neighborhood. Well, this is what happened to a very close-knit community near downtown Syracuse called the 15th Ward. Right now, we'll journey back 60 years ago to hear their emotional and their life-altering stories. Years ago, they called the districts, now they call them wards. We were the 15th ward. I lived at 751 Harrison Street. We lived in the 400 block of Madison Street. We were on Adams Street for, uh, for most of my life, 418 Adams Street. They lived at 116 and I lived at 118 Radisson Court. They are the sons and the daughters of what used to be the 15th Ward. To understand their story, we have to journey back to the mid-1900s to a small close-knit neighborhood just to the east and south of downtown Syracuse. When we were kids, we didn't really leave the ward that much. We didn't go north. We went east up to Thornton Park. That's about as far as we got. But we didn't move out of our neighborhood that much. That's probably why we were so close. Junie Dunham was there since the 1930s. But before him, during the century from the mid-1800s to the 1950s, the 15th Ward had a very different makeup. 15th Ward was very small comprised of mostly Jews and Blacks, affectionately called Jewtown, the old 15th Ward. Blacks really didn't start moving into Syracuse until the 30s. I was born in 34. Blacks, after the Second World War, migrated to Syracuse from the South, 47, 48, 49. Mary and Irvin came from South Carolina. They were you know, hard working people and came up for a better life. They didn't want to work on the farm because it wasn't, wasn't enough work for everybody anyway. So they came up for a better opportunity. As the Jewish population started to move out, the 15th Ward became home to Syracuse's black population. Oh, that looks like uh, Liz Breland. Wait a minute. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on. That is Liz Breland. Creating that proverbial village for women like Liz Page and Carolyn Jackson. You could walk around any time of night, any mm -hmm. place, and you know, if anybody bothered you, could run in somebody's house that you knew. That's right. But yeah. nobody bothered you. We're looking at what helped hold us together was the churches, mm -hmm. was Dunbar. Huntington was over there in my age coming up. <laughs> And of course, there was always entertainment. Yeah. Legendary guitarist Bobby Green. We stand on the street corners 
couple guys, they have their group over there. We have our group over here that's on different corners in the same block. See who can sing the best to get the girls to come over to you. People would cuss us out, get the hell away from my window with that noise, you know, stuff like that. Many of those memories captured through the lens of Richard Breland. You had to hit the clicker up and down. He's best known today as Central New York's movie host, but at 11, Richard Breland was taking photos around his home in the 15th Ward. Where was this at? What was this, this, is the, this is the house where we lived in for almost 26 years. Although to some, the ward was known as the slums or the ghetto because of the aging housing, the life seen in Breland's photos was a good one. I wanted to take pictures uh, at the time because it, it was fun to look at the pictures and, of people. And, and then I said, I may not see them anymore. He could never have known just how prophetic those words would be. In this century, America has become a nation on wheels. We ride on wheels to work, to shop, to play, to go about any place we want to go. We depend on wheels to bring us the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the things we use. But when we depend on wheels, we depend also on highways and roads and streets for the wheels to roll on. By 1956, there were more than 65 million cars on our roads, with 90 million forecast by 1975. In 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the Federal Highway Act, authorizing construction of a vast modern highway system. There was nearly $25 billion of funding available under the act, and New York got in on the deal, paving the way for Interstate 81. They will take the over-the-road driver from city to city, coast to coast, at highway speeds, even through large population centers. The federal aid... All your highways went through black neighborhoods. In other words, they moved the blacks right out. They went to the area of least resistance. Many black and marginalized communities were redlined, like the one here in this map, denied mortgages under discriminatory lending practices. That meant developers stayed away, and during the interstate boom, many of those communities were torn down to make room for highways. The story wasn't much different in the 15th Ward. We heard about the tearing up of all the houses around State Street, Adams Street, all the places where people we knew lived, mm -hmm. just decimated. Urban renewal also came into play in the 50s. Its goal, to revitalize the city and eliminate substandard housing. For the economic elite, it would bring growth to the city. For those in the 15th Ward, the construction of 81 and urban renewal programs brought decimation. People were demonstrating so that the houses would not be torn down, but we didn't have the resources, the political knowledge or the financial knowledge, how to stop it. For those who lived in the 15th Ward, it seemed the future had already been decided. I would, we used to sit around and talk about it. You know, my friends, uh, why, did, why did they destroy our neighborhood? And, boom, this and that. You had no say. We had nobody, we had no representation. There were no blacks when I was a kid in office. Churches and organizations like the NAACP and CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, protested all the demolition work. And we would picket kids, adults, uh, teenagers, uh, black and white. Uh, it was not, you know, just all blacks or all whites. It was all of us being involved in 
our homes, basically, and the heart being ripped out of the 15th Ward, mm -hmm. essentially. It felt like you, to me, it felt like, it, why do we have to pick it to save houses we've already lived in? So it felt like somebody had ripped out a part of my soul. Despite the protests, the demolition began. All you can see is, you know, uh, they're coming in and these big trucks and whatever going in. It was heartbreaking uh, because this was our home. This is where we grew up in. And, and to see someone come in to demolish it and, and, and it's gone. And, and it's, it's they gone. tore down Bethany. Yeah. When 81 and, 690, uh, 81 and 690 make that curve, that's where Bethany used to be. St. Phillips was on Adams Street. Uh, uh, right around the corner. Elman Street, right around the right corner, around the took corner. that out. We had lost yeah. everything that we had ever known. We had lost the camaraderie of our neighbors and uh, our friends. And we just, it, it, was, it was horrible. Everything was different. I was only in the service for two years. And um, all where I used to live, all that, all that was gone. All was gone. Urban renewal and the construction of Interstate 81 marked the beginning of the end for the 15th Ward. Almost all of that close-knit community was now gone. We had urban renewal and this is what's going to happen and this is, you know, if we clean up everything, everything will be all pretty and clean. But even if it's pretty and clean, it's like gentrification now. You can't go back to where you were. Everything changed. Some people said it changed for the better because they tore these old houses down that were old and raggedy and boom, boom, boom. No, it changed because they went to the area of least resistance, tear the property down, put the highways through. Once they tore all the houses down, blacks had to go somewhere because it was, you know, all our neighborhood was gone, demolished. It was heartbreaking, but it was in a way, it was a good thing because it gave black people a chance to spread out more. Marion Urban's family was able to use state money for relocation services. We moved in 1962 from Madison Street to 212 East Castle Street back then. That's the first time my parents had bought a house. They got, they were one of the first people, first family, to take advantage of the urban renewal, that program for buying homes. It was a big move for us. I mean, you go from being a renter to a, home, a landlord, as you say, that's a big move. Got my dinner ready yet, honey? Home ownership was a major advantage for families who had enough money to afford a home. For others, though, their troubles were just beginning. You can see it in these headlines, house rentals refused to Negroes, or nobody will sell Negro officer a home. The grim reality of starting over was setting in. I said, um, my name is Mr. Dunham. I'm calling the rent an apartment, I, it was in the paper. And I, I, right off the bat, I told him I was a Negro. Back then, he said Negro. Uh, and he said, oh, oh, oh. Oh, Mr. Dunham, it's not me. I just rent the place. It's, it's the landlord. He doesn't want any Negroes here. You had a restricted area that you knew you weren't supposed to. And real estate agents did not show people in those homes. You would see something listed in the paper, and when you would get there, they say, oh, it was just rented. Or they would say, I don't mind, the landlord would say, I don't mind you living here, but the neighbors might object. So the struggle continued, this time for fair housing. A Post Standard article from 1963 chronicles the Syracuse March for Fair Housing. It drew 350 protesters, black, white, young, and old. 
CORE, the local chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, was one of the most vocal organizers. In this publication, the group said its goal was to bring the human element into the Syracuse Urban Renewal Program. CORE, we did the black and white team, the salt and pepper teams. Mm -hmm. Black couple goes out, mm -hmm. then the white couple, they don't the, get the apartment. Right. The white couple goes out, they get the apartment. You send a back, black person back again, they don't get the apartment. So we did that all over. On the same day as the Syracuse March, Mayor William Walsh spoke from the steps of the county courthouse saying, quote, it is essential that the blight of discrimination be guarded against and that equal opportunity for all to be advanced. Housing complaints, though, were still piling up with the State Commission of Human Rights. In many places we couldn't go because they, wouldn't like, they didn't want us there, you know when they were moving us. So they said, well, we move everybody south. Many black families migrated to other parts of the city, mainly the south side. They left behind that close-knit community feel of the 15th Ward. The disadvantage to having us spread out, I don't know if we used all our political powers in the 15th Ward or its fringes, but with the scatteration, Blacks were all over, so that mm -hmm. diluted mm -hmm. any political power mm -hmm. or emphasis we wanted to be involved in. All of that would eventually change. Although the 15th Ward no longer existed, the spirit and determination grew even stronger. Those who were displaced found housing. A few years later, successful protests resulted in more and better jobs for blacks at companies like Niagara Mohawk. In the early 70s, Junie Dunham was elected to the Onondaga County Legislature, and others went on to become prominent forces in the community. The sons and the daughters of the 15th Ward would not allow their struggle to define their story. Years later though, as the future of Route 81 was called into question, many wondered, was history repeating itself? In the year 2019, all that's left of the 15th Ward are pictures and memories. The historic Amy Zion Church on East Fayette Street is one of the few structures left standing from the early 1900s. It's almost like, you know, if I had a little red cart that I loved and to play with, and then someone come and took it away from me. And that was my cart, you know. And I said, where am I going to get another cart like that? You know, and it was, it was mine, it was my, you know. And so it's like your home, you, you, just like the word home. Home is home. I don't care who it is or whatever it is. When you're living in there and you, you grew up there, that's home, you know. You know, we, we get together, we talk about different spots just to reminisce, but we can't show our kids what we used to have and what we used to do and where we used to go to for entertainment. When we moved to East Castle Street, they were all, you, they got that now, they call it Brick City. All right, they were just starting with that. All those were homes all the way up on East Castle, all the way down Oakwood, all the way down State Street. They were private, they were apartment houses. They were one, two, three, four families. They all would knock down. Everybody was upset when they tore it down. <laughs> well, it's not only enjoyed living. We didn't have any other place to go. Yeah, but you didn't care about going any place else because you didn't know any other place to go. Right, I mean, right. As there a were kid, no opportunities. As a young right. teenager, I could care less because all my friends were over there.
Many of the homes that once lined these streets, now replaced by Upstate University Hospital, businesses, as well as an aging interstate. According to the State Department of Transportation, the section of Route 81 that cuts through the old 15th Ward has reached the end of its functional life. The debate over how to replace it has gone on for a decade or more, and there's still no decision on what comes next. The people who were displaced when the interstate slashed through their community some 60 years ago have moved on. But the love and the memories of the 15th Ward will remain in their hearts forever. The 15th Ward no longer exists, but its spirit still lives on through the people who grew up there. Their story of love, determination, as well as sacrifice can truly be a lesson to us all. I'm Jennifer Sanders. Thank you so much again for joining me for this special edition of Hidden History.